Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, thanks for coming on. Uh, in terms of the agenda tonight, I'm going to make a few introductory uh, comments, set a bit of this context for, for consultation, and then I'm going to hand over to Madeline Hall, who's going to detail what the proposed changes are, so walk you through those. Secondly, to cover off some of our observations and perhaps pros and cons, um, we want to share with you uh, some of the feedback that you've given us so far. So we've we've got a survey out there, which we encourage all of you to participate in, but we want to give you uh, an early sight of that. We've had about 100 farmers answer that survey uh, so far. We want to really encourage you to have your say, um, but also how you can provide feedback to us, which is really, really valuable for us, um, providing your perspective into this consultation uh, as well. And, and then we'll just give you some next steps and, and context, context, I should say. So a few uh, observations from me, just to set the scene. If we think about the NZ ETS, the whole idea of the ETS is that it was set up to, to drive uh, reductions in carbon emissions. And there is a widespread acknowledgement that that isn't uh, fulfilling its purpose at the moment, and, and thus uh, some of the background behind this consultation uh, from the government. If we put on our sheep and beef industry or red meat industry uh, hat, there, there are a number of angles here. And We've had a lot of feedback from farmers uh, around this issue. And, and, and what is the feedback we've had? Well, firstly, uh, there is a lot of concern about the wholesale land use change. Uh, what people will see is, is mainly driven by the carbon price. Uh, and so we're seeing whole farms uh, converted into forestry with, with carbon price as a, as a real driver. And people are really concerned about uh, what that means for uh, rural communities. Um, secondly, uh, what we've seen, and Madeline will refer to this uh, in a few moments, is, is we've really seen an escalation in, in land prices, in particular hill country. And so there's a lot of concern that you know, sheep and beef farmers are being locked out of uh, purchasing that land, and particularly young farmers as they seek to enter the industry as well. Um, a third concern is really around critical mass in the industry. So, you know, if we lose hill country, which has traditionally been so important uh, as our breeding country, uh, as our nursery of, of store stock, um, what does this mean for the ongoing future of the industry and, and for those finishers? Uh, where do they get their stock from? And, and for processors, are concerned about stock numbers as well. Um, on the other side, for farmers, if, if a farmer is, you know, at the end of uh, their career, um, these escalation of, of land values is, um, you know, is a massive reward for them for sometimes 30 or 40 years of uh, hard work. You know, they're able to monetize in a way that they couldn't uh, before. For, for other farmers, they absolutely see an opportunity here uh, in terms of um, diversifying their income streams, uh, managing the risk, uh, getting the, the best value out of some of their uh, class, you know, seven and eight land, uh, for example. So, so there's many farmers that that see uh, the carbon uh, price, and and indeed the ETS is is, uh, is a really real option uh, for them. And and then, you know, to look at it from another angle, we have our Māori farmers who uh, have been often constrained uh, by capital, sometimes legally constrained in what they've been able to do with their land, and you know, the, this carbon farming option offer, offers or, or carbon forestry and, and combination offers a really good opportunity uh, to grow uh, their revenue and, and indeed fulfill some of the obligations uh, to their members. So the challenge really as we look at this issue is how do we sit, uh, how do we hit the sweet spot whereby absolutely we start to deal with some of these concerns of the community while not shutting the gate on the opportunities uh, for our farmers as well. So, um, you know, why why is this consultation um, so important? Um, it is a big issue and it is having an impact on our sector and on our communities. So this is the first time the government is consulting on the specific use of forestry offsets since the ETS 
uh, started in 2008. And uh, the government has previously uh, proposed changes at a high level to the permanent uh, category, but now they're providing uh, more detail around those and, and seeking specific feedback. So for us, um, we want your thoughts. Um, tonight is really about providing you an overview and an understanding of what the options are, some of our observations, potential pros and cons, and indeed um, sharing some of the feedback that you've given us uh, so far. So um, I, I encourage you to take the opportunity to have uh, further input, and we'd love to hear from you. And I'll hand over to Madeline now to uh, take us forward from here. Great. Thanks, Sam. So just a bit of context for you all. Um, the ETS was set up in 20 or 2008, rather, um, and there's been quite a bit of fluctuation in the price since that time. But since the zero carbon bill or there were changes made in 2019 to the Climate Change Response Act, um, there's been a significant increase in the price over time, going from around uh, $30 a ton at the end of last year to around $90 a ton. The price has now gone back down to about 40, um, based on a number of government decisions. However, um, that price increase has drastically changed the expected returns per hectare from different land uses. And based on some uh, estimates that we were able to uh, commission last year, um, ETS forestry as a land use option far and away out outperforms other uh, traditional land uses, including sheep and beef, and for harvest forest. As a result of those economic drivers, we've seen significant land use change that's going further and faster than what has been recommended by uh, the expert parties for um, what we need to be doing to achieve our climate change targets. This includes a lot of purchase of land with the intent to convert pasture into forestry. Although there's a number of different types of forests that are being uh, transitioned to, so including Manuka, traditional rotation uh, forestry or carbon forestry, um, overall, we're seeing a quite substantial cumulative increase in the amount of land that has been converted from sheep and beef farm farms to forests or carbon forestry. So based on this, there's actually a few different ways that you can change the status quo. The key consideration is changes to the emissions trading scheme, which is what's being currently consulted on. This is the core driver for the change in land use that we're seeing. In addition, there can be changes made to the Overseas Investment Office, um, which provides allowances for international investors to buy land in New Zealand. Lastly, you can also make changes to the conditions under the RMA or the incoming piece of legislation that we have, changes to our resource management system, which can better impact manage the impacts of carbon forestry. So you can start at the source of the incentive or you can manage the impacts of that incentive. So how does the ETS actually work? Well, the goal at the end of the day is to be reducing emissions so that we are achieving our international obligations. Based on the most recent estimates, um, the ability for New Zealand to meet our international um, commitments could be the cost of anywhere between three and $26 billion by 2030. And that cost is heavily influenced by the amount of reduction, re emissions reductions or removals that we make between now and then. Over time, um, it is the responsibility of the emitters to pay for their emissions. And they pay for their emissions by um, giving paying the right to emit to the government. In essence, it works by government giving or selling some units to the emitters, and the emitters pay the government for their emissions. Foresters are then paid for their emissions removals if they choose to enter the scheme. In this program, the government is a seller and regulator of emissions. And just to note, um, our emissions trading scheme is one of the very few in the world um, 
that actually allows full participation of forestry and unlimited use of forestry offsets. In our scheme, the government is the seller and the regulator of emissions. The government makes emitters pay for their emissions to drive them to reduce their emissions over time. Government can sell the carbon units to emitters to gain some revenue that they use to support emissions reductions outside of the scheme. Emitters can buy emissions from either the government or from foresters. They can also choose to reduce their emissions over time so they face less liabilities. On top of emitters, we also have some investors who can play in the market who buy and sell units based on um, their potential to increase and decrease over time and how they think they will rise and fall. Lastly, but not least, foresters can sell the, um, their units to emitters. As context, trees remove carbon from the atmosphere as they grow. And certain forests can be rewarded for this in the emissions trading scheme. In the ETS, there are two ways that forests can essentially get credits. One, by entering into the averaging category, which tends to usually apply to rotation for harvest forest systems, or you can enter into the permanent forest category, which right now is mostly predominated, or mostly, well, predominantly, sorry, native forests. The key difference is that rotation forests gets turned into wood products that around age 25 to 30 will be turned into wood products that can then be sold overseas. Depending on the products that the wood is being used for, that carbon can be stored in those wood products anywhere from a year if it's used for a pallet or 50 to 100 years if it's used in furniture. Eventually, the carbon will be released back into the atmosphere as those wood products decompose. Permanent forest, on the other hand, is planted with the intention to remain in forest for at least 50 years, if not longer. There are plenty of different tree species that can live to 50 years old, but most of the trees that are currently entered in this category are natives, which can live upward of 800 years after establishment. When we're considering all of this, the carbon price can be changed depending on the different actions of the government or emitters or foresters. Higher carbon prices are seen um, when there is a increased demand for units and lower prices is when there's a lower demand for units. The price for the market is determined by basically what the government, foresters or investors are willing to sell at and what emitters are willing to buy at first place. Currently, we're seeing a lot more tree planting than emissions reductions, but the government has indicated quite strongly that they want more emission reductions than forestry offsets. This is based on the recommendations from the Climate Change Commission, which is an independent body that was set up a few years ago, to give advice to the government of the day about what policy changes need to occur to ensure that we are meeting our domestic and international obligations. If we don't make any changes to how the ETS is currently set up, it's quite likely that because of the amount of units currently in the scheme, as a result of the increased forest planting that we've seen of late, we'll actually have a drop in the carbon price over time, or it will stay about the same that it is now, around $35, $40, which the government has indicated today is not high enough in order to drive the emissions reductions that they want to see. So the government is looking to uh, seek submitters' views on ways to change this. First, they wanna ask whether or not the ETS should be prioritizing emissions reductions over emissions offsets. Right now, there's not a differentiation between the two in the market, but since uh, the government has indicated their policy preference for reductions, they're wanting to confirm that assumption with others. They also wanna have an understanding of what options we would prefer based on what they have consulted on, or if we have any other options to put forward. On top of that, um, they have put forward some questions and some potential options 
in terms of changes to the permanent forest category, which is in addition to the consultation that they did in April last year and got some existing feedback on. They're also really keen to hear about anything that, that we think they're missing on. So if we have any other ideas, any other considerations that we think need to be included, they're really open to hearing that. So what are the options on the table? In terms of the least amount of change, we can keep things as the status quo. And then we go through the options one, two, three, and four, with four um, being the greatest changes. Now, the wording that's tended to be used in these consultation documents is um, somewhat accessible, but really policy wonkery oriented. So I've tried to go ahead and visualize some of these changes so that we can better understand them. So option one, the goal here is for the government to reduce the amount of units that they allocate into the market. This means that over time, there would be an increase in the demand for units from forestry. So the money going from emitters to foresters would increase, but the money going from emitters to government would decrease. As a result of this, we'd likely have an increase in the emissions offsets or emissions removals as compared to emissions reductions. Option two. What's going on here is essentially the government is expanding the um, amount of buyers that can enter into the emissions trading scheme. They can do that by allowing international buyers into the market, or they, as the government, can also become buyers in the, in the scheme. What this means is that cumulatively, there's a lot more demand for the forestry units that are in the emissions trading scheme, and it's unclear necessarily what impact that would have on the price. But it would mean that because um, emitters have a greater demand or greater competition from forestry units or others around, it, the government may not necessarily get as much money as they did before from the sale of units through their auctioning mechanism, just to clarify. Option three. In this option, the government basically limits the amount of forestry units that emitters can use to meet their obligations, or the government can limit the amount of uh, units that are being given to foresters in the first place. What this means is that the price for units that are going to the government and the amount of income they receive goes up and the amount of income that forest removers receive goes down. In terms of what we see over the balance between emissions reductions and emissions removals, it's likely that there would be a greater incentive to encourage emissions reductions rather than emissions removals or offsets. And last button, but not least, option four. So as this was indicated, um, this is the biggest change potentially on the table. Um, and it essentially means separating out the forest uh, participants from others in the emissions trading scheme. So it kind of cuts out the emitters as the middle people but in here. And the government would be buying units directly from foresters. And then they would be selling those units back into emitters um, for a price of their choosing. The likely impact of this is that the government would be buying units at a lower price than what they are then selling them onto emitters. Whether or not that eventuates, who knows, but it does put quite a bit of uncertainty into the market. In terms of the impacts that we would be seeing, um, it really depends on how those levers are structured. The government, based on the price that they're willing to pay for those forestry removals, could be ramping up the amount of removals that we see or reducing them based on the price that they're willing to pay uh, depending on that time. So before we go on, I'll just have a quick pause for questions, if there's any. Um, great, question about slide? Yes, they will be available, cool. But yes, very happy to take any other questions as we go along. In addition to the options that the government has presented for changes to the emissions trading scheme, 
They've also put forward some high level proposals about their um, interest in people's feedback on how incentives for removals that provide co-benefits can be provided for. So that includes co-benefits like erosion control or biodiversity or climate resilience and how best we can do that and how that should be connected or not. They've also indicated that they want to change the ETS settings to increase the recognition of alternative categories of carbon removals. This could include uh, carbon vegetation categories such as uh, riparian planting or um, removals from trees that are established prior to 1990. It can also include uh, carbon that is stored in alternative forms of removals, such as uh, blue carbon or via wetlands. Oh, hi, Lynn. We've just got one question that's come through. Um, yeah. That's from Joyce, and she's asked, so people that trade in carbon units add nothing to reduction, do they? This should be banned. Interesting point. Yeah, so right now there's full access for people to trade and then use on the stock exchange. And looking at the history, um, as other stocks have declined in the New Zealand market, uh, the stock of the carbon price or the NZU carbon market um, has been the best performing investment over the last five years um, and throughout the pandemic, which is really interesting for many investors who now have a very strong interest in how the emissions trading scheme operates. So those are the proposals that have been put forward to the settings for the wider ETS and the relationship between units um, that are bought and sold among the government emitters and foresters. One of the other subcategories of forests within the emissions trading scheme is this permanent forest category. Last year, the government consulted on proposed changes to this permanent forest category based on the significant concerns raised by Beef and Lamb and many others about the impacts that these kinds of forests can have if they're not managed adequately. They asked about what species should be allowed into the scheme, what management requirements, if any, there should be, and where these forests could be established. Based on the responses that they've received, there was a whole lot of variety in what people wanted and what their expectations were. And you can see this by the pie graph um, as included to the right. So in this secondary part of the review, they've come back to submitters and asked a few more, um, more particular questions. So they've asked which forests should be allowed into the scheme with the understanding that the government has indicated their preference to still include exotics. Secondly, how should carbon be given to exotics um, if they're intended to transition over time into native forests? And how should uh, permanent forests be managed? And what conditions or requirements should there be for their compliance? So first question, which forest should be allowed in? In the permanent forest category, you can have only native forests. You can have forests that are planted initially as exotics and then potentially transition over time from exotics into natives. And that can be done through specific management actions or in theory, depending on the right place um, and, and situational types, as the older trees die, the younger um, native forests will come through, which will average out to quite a significant amount of carbon stored in that area over time. You can also allow uh, exotics as they are into the scheme, but the government is asking for specific feedback on some subcategories of exotics. This includes longer lived species such as redwoods, exotics that are established on Maori owned land, as well as exotics that are established on the small scale within farming operations. The government has also asked how um, carbon should be allocated to forests that are initially planted as exotics, but then are intended to transition to natives over time. And one of the key risks here, both for the government and for participants, is that when those exotic trees die off, the carbon is then lost to the atmosphere. 
because that wood is decomposing, it's releasing carbon back. And currently there's a giant surrender liability that is on the participant in this program, where as the exotics die off, potentially between 80 and 120 odd years, um, there's that gap that they are then responsible for as the indigenous forest grows, but doesn't actually meet the peak that the exotic forest has already achieved. What they're proposing to do to change this and reduce this risk for both the government and for participants is to go into um, essentially an averaging scheme so that um, the amount of carbon that would be allocated to these kinds of forests would be limited over time, but they wouldn't be liable to return those units um, as the forest transitions from exotics to natives. In terms of management, they've been asking, well, do we need a change in requirements? And if so, do we need to have some minimum standards? Who should those minimum standards apply to? Should they apply to all participants of the category, regardless of the type of forest or the scale of forest that they have? Only to transition forests that are going from exotic to native, or only just to, exo to exotic forests? And there's another question about, well, if you have standards, how flexible should they be? Should, be? should you have really strict rules that apply in every situation, regardless of the context? Or should you be having a really flexible approach using forest management plans that are cognizant of the uh, location-specific conditions? Lastly, it's important to make sure that any participation that's occurring in this program is keeping up to scratch. So what reporting requirements should there be? Should those change depending on the type of forest that you have established? And what are the consequences that are put in place if you don't keep up with what you've said you would do? So some observations so far. And again, just a wonderful reminder. Actually, do, Lucy, do we have um, any questions that have popped up? Yes, we've got a couple of questions. Um, there are a couple of follow-on comments, I guess, from the last question just around investors being banned from playing in the ETS and trading. So something to note there. Um, and then relating to the target around transitioning exotic to native, we've got a question around, um, has there been much work done on transitioning exotics to natives? Um, and a comment that uh, Eleanor doesn't think it will work. And then, so if you want to answer that question, if you've got any. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so um, there has been a lot of questions and concerns raised by uh, many experts who are forest ecologists about the likelihood of transition from exotics into natives. And the Ministry for Primary Industries commissioned an external and expert report to get the, give them an understanding about how these things can happen. The findings of that report are that it's really, really site specific and it's really management dependent. So in most situations across the country, you can't just plant and walk away and have an exotic turn into a native. Yeah, so that kind of flows onto this question, not much grows under pine. So how long do they think it will take to transition? It really depends on the site. So if there's um, a significant seed source or seed dispersal, potentially there's, there's that. Uh, there's an argument as um, once the trees die off, there's some additional light wells, um, but it also depends on the soil conditions as well as the climate conditions. So there isn't a really clear answer to that question in terms of when that transition will actually happen. Perfect. So um, hopefully that's answered those kind of questions around transitioning. Um, if not, feel free to follow up on in the comments or raise your hand if you need further explanation. Um, We've got a question here. If it's Māori that don't want changes, why can't the government segment off their land so they can keep the investment they have but not hold the rest of the country to a flawed policy? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And there is an option because of the way that Māori land is potentially structured to um, have different conditions for forests that are established on Māori owned or Māori managed land as compared to other participants in the program. 
And that's potentially one of the options that's been put forward under the permanent forest sink category, but that could be applying to the wider ETS forestry changes as well. Oh, um, and then there's two final questions on that topic and then we might continue on with the um, presentation. So one is if a farm has been in pasture for years and is then planted in pines, it will not suddenly produce natives as there is absolutely no seed source there. I guess that's kind of more of a comment. So thank you, Eleanor. And then Sally's asked, what stops the pine trees from reseeding? Um, the short answer is genetics. <laughs> yeah, so a lot of the new plantings um, and species of pine that are being established now within the industry um, are clones of one another and are essentially um, unable to breed very easily. Um, however, depending on where they're in the country, um, there is a significant risk of wilding and um, where there is seed dispersal and they can naturally become established. This is a really big problem down in the South Island, especially. Um, and some of the alternative species um, that don't necessarily have the same kind of um, breeding characteristics as some of the new forms of pine um, can also be potentially really tricky. Oh, great, thanks, Madeline. Um, continue on. Great, okay, on we go. So in terms of what some of the options could mean, um, options three and four would, at the end of the day, restrict the use of forestry offsets by emitters and potentially have a greater ability to provide um, recognition for the co-benefits of forestry or carbon forests in whatever shape and form. Based on the problems that we as uh, beef and lamb have identified in the, in the past, um, options one and two will likely increase the problems that we see and uh, will lead to further uh, amounts of plantings as compared to emissions reductions. We're really grateful to see that the government is interested in providing greater recognition of co-benefits of uh, carbon forestry and of wider forests. So that's really great to see that they're interested and eager to progress. And it's also really good to see that they're interested in providing recognition and reward for um, different types of sequestration or um, different vegetation categories than what are currently being recognized. In terms of the permanent forest options, we haven't landed on a position in, in this category or any other category, but it could make sense to um, allow exotics and transition forests into the category but with some really strong conditions. Changing the carbon rules for the transition forests makes a bit of sense because you're reducing that risk both for the participant and for the crown. And you're making sure that there, that really strong incentives that exists right now to plant and walk away is taken away. Forest management plans for exotics um, make sense along with some additional requirements for transition forests and some really strong compliance to make sure that that transition is effectively occurring over time. And if it isn't occurring, that there is management actions that can be taken to make sure that does happen. You could also have a regime where the compliance for different types of forests is based on the risk that they pose. So if you're a larger scale carbon forestry operation, you have greater requirements, but if you're smaller scale, you may not have as many. And the requirements for native forests um, registered in the category could be less than exotics, for example. So we've been um, seeking farmer feedback on this via a survey so far, and we're really, really keen to hear your feedback tonight. Um, I just wanted to give you a bit of a summary of what we've heard to date um, based on the survey that we've sent out. And if you haven't already completed the survey, I go ahead and encourage you to do that. It should be linked in our e-diaries sent out tomorrow. So some of the questions that we asked people that um, included some strongly agreed to statements include the need to make fundamental changes to the ETS, to increase the recognition for carbon storage um, in on-farm vegetation, and to slow the conversion of large number of sheep and beef farms into carbon forestry. On the other hand, there are a couple of statements that 
people indicated that they really disagreed with, or rather, there's some pretty mixed views across the table. The first includes whether or not you should be allowing exotics into the category of permanent forests in the first place, especially if they're intended to transition to natives over time. If you should be having specific exemptions for exotics if they are planted on Maori owned land. And if you should be limiting the amount of forestry planted within a farm system. We also got quite a bit of variety in neutral statements. That includes whether or not there should be limits on the amount of forestry that can be planted within a given region, whether or not farmers should be allowed to use forestry offsets as compared to emitters and only providing that luxury to farmers, and whether or not exotics should be allowed to enter the permanent forest category if they are longer lived species like redwoods. <clears throat> So with that, I'm going to go ahead and open it up for questions and discussion. Oh, so we've got um, a question here from Graham that must be admiring your backdrop. Um, in the photo landscape backdrop behind Melon, there's integrated pastoral sheep and beef farmland and permanent indigenous native bush blocks, probably pre-1989. So Graham wants to know, how does this acknowledge the ETS, how does the ETS acknowledge the carbon locked within these blocks and what if the carbon increases additionality post-1990? How is this accommodated with the ETS now or within proposed options? Um, that's question. a really, yeah, that's you a really, really great right. question. Yeah. Um, so, so just to kind of summarize it back um, and to provide a bit of context, so currently in, in the emission training scheme, only forests that were established after 1990 can be entered into the scheme voluntarily and receive carbon credits. <clears throat> exotic forests that were established prior to 1990 can face liabilities if they are cut down and not replanted. So essentially a change in land use from forest to a different land use. In terms of older natives, this is a category that the government has signaled through negotiations in the Hawaki Genoa Partnership, that there is some opportunity to provide greater recognition for the carbon stored in these areas, especially as a result of additional management taken by farmers over time to increase the health and vitality of these areas. That then has a co-benefit associated with biodiversity and increased carbon removals. It's really great to see that the government is interested in expanding recognition for this kind of forest and is open to how um, the additional benefits provided by that active management, such as for biodiversity, could be recognized in or outside of the emissions trading scheme. So it's really great to see that they're interested in this, but we're still really early days in terms of what this could actually look like in practice. Cool. And then the second part of um, Graham's question was around what are the incentives to maintain food production, particularly in pastoral hill country, the short-term gains currently offered by carbon forestry? Yeah. In, in the meantime, um, the current incentive based on the price of carbon is to change land use, right? And so there aren't really any strong signals being sent um, at the moment by the government to continue to remain in sheep and beef farming right now, which is quite disappointing given the amount of food that we provide um, that is very high quality, really, really low emissions in comparison to other competitors um, and provides a really healthy, clean product that people are really asking for. Oh, thank you. A um, uh, question from Dean, what are the risks and benefits for continuous cover exotic forestry? That's a really good question. And Dean probably can answer it better than I can. Um, so just as some context, continuous cover forestry is essentially where um, you plant a forest and then when it comes time to harvest, you leave some of those trees standing. So that way um, you're not cutting down everything in, in clear fell and you're not exposing the soil all at once. So the, the risks of that are um, you don't necessarily get as much wood supply as you'd be expecting. You potentially are creating a lot of roading and infrastructure that isn't necessarily being best used, right? But the benefit is that you're maintaining the canopy 
of that area and you're protecting the soil underneath that forest um, so that if there is a big rain event, you don't have a whole lot of soil washing down all at once. And you're maintaining that area that potentially is erosion prone by keeping the um, health of that root system holding the soil together. Cool. Um, so I think that's the, the questions that have been asked. Um, and I do note that there's been a few comments left as well. So we will be kind of copying and downloading all the comments that are left. So don't worry about us not seeing them. Um, if anyone has a question that they're wanting to ask verbally, um, you're more than welcome. Just um, under the reactions toolbar at the bottom of your page, um, there'll be a raise hand option. So if you put that on, up, I can unmute you and you can verbally ask any questions. Um, oh, Joyce has asked, Sorry. Uh, why, oh, Sam. Sorry, there's just one from Sally Dryland there. Should most of pre-1990 have been harvested by now, especially if pines? Yeah, so this is the key difference in terms of pre-1990 um, conditions of deforestation versus harvest. So um, yes, most pre-1990 forests would have been harvested by now. And if it's replanted, there's no conditions. But if that area is not replanted, then there are liabilities for the landowner to pay back, right? And there was a time earlier on when the ETS was initially set up that people could be applying for exemptions, um, but that time has now passed, although there is still some niggly little wiggle rounds that lots of carbon forestry experts can get you through, um, but it is a pretty challenging process to go through that. Oh, and thanks, Sam, I did miss that one. Um... So we've got a question from Joyce saying, are wildling pines being included in the ETS at all? Ooh. I might, and I might have to pass to um, any of the officials who are on the call, um, but from my recollection, um, they are currently being counted towards our international forestry accounting rules because some of these areas do meet the forest carbon definition. Um, but we the the government has been discouraging their participation in the emissions trading scheme and being recognized by the emissions trading scheme and there are some um potential provisions that are included within the emissions trading scheme that allow people to go and clear these areas without facing carbon liabilities cool. um Eleanor has asked, is there an option to get carbon credits if you planted your whole farm in poplars and still carried on grazing underneath? And Dean has said yes. Um, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that, Madeline. Yes. So this is one of my favorite categories of ETS um, details um, as a former soil conservator working in the Hawke's Bay. Um, so yes, there is opportunity for farmers to get recognition for the carbon storage in their space planted poplars. They have to be meeting certain conditions um, on that site in order to um, be receiving those units, such as a 30% canopy cover, um, kind of minimum standards around how far away they are and how close they are together. Um, but in general, it is an option. And for some of the farmers who have planted um, space planter poplars on their property, it provides a really great co-income stream to um, sell the carbon units that are generated from those poplars and willows that are space planted and still retain the stock that are grazing underneath those areas. And there could be some co-benefits there associated with shade and shelter provided to those animals, as well as the erosion control benefits um, or fodder benefits of those uh, poplars and willows. Well, um, Eleanor's just put another comment down. Um, would you know much about grass? growth underneath kind of poplars yes yeah um so there there's a really cool research program that's underway by plant and food research um and they have some really cool details on their website i'm pretty sure it's called the poplars and willow trust um from recollection depending on the um amount of light and depending on the soil conditions that are there there's around a 10 percent decline in the potential me metabolic energy that is provided and accessible to the animal by that grass if it's growing underneath uh, poplars and willows. However, there's a new research program that's just been started 
by the our land and water um, research science programs that is investigating um, how real this is over time. And if there's actually some additional co-benefits for soil carbon associated with um, the, the grazing and leaf litter of um, the yeah, occurring around those areas. Oh, perfect. Um, Sally has asked, is there recognition for erosion control that a one hectare minimum size is bigger than what is required in many cases? Mm. Yeah, and this is something that can be challenging. So um, in a lot of places um, planted along um, the landscape, you don't necessarily need a full hectare of planting of poplars and willows in order to satisfy your need for erosion control planting, right? But the current minimum requirement is for one hectare um, in order to be entered into the scheme. And the government has indicated, indicated um, that they could be willing to look at changes in the scheme so that you could have smaller areas of forest being entered, or you could have forests that have those co-benefits such as erosion control um, allowed to enter, um, even if they're not being uh, recognized as much for their carbon. Oh, so it looks like we're all caught up on questions again. Right. See if any more come through. Oh, here we go. Um, how easy is it for speculators to play the NZ ETS carbon price market, which can distort the price up or down and this in turn impacts farm sale and price? Is this a concern with ETS review? Um, are there any controls to limit speculation? So that's question one. And then there's a second question that I can... Yeah, that's a really good question. And the government hasn't indicated a review of this whatsoever um, as part of their consultation process. And there and there is a question to consider about um, how the investors in the secondary market are having an influence on the carbon price, and thus the drive of emissions reductions as compared to removals that we receive. And this is something that we've considered um, including as part of additional information that the government should be considering um, when conducting this review, especially because it's kind of going back to the absolute basics of the scheme about where minutes, where units would be coming from and who would be buying them. And um, the relationship between the government allocated uni units into the scheme and then how emitters or investors are then buying those units um, to meet different uh, interests, including just playing the market itself. Well, and then a second question within that same comment was, how well is it understood that land use flexibility will be deleted when a forest used for the ETS? Then it is forever a forest, but the carbon price has only limited tenure. Yeah, that's a really good point. So um, there is concern out there that people... Um, are participating in the ETS without understanding the full risks of participating in the in the ETS, as well as the impact of what that could mean. Um, I had one farm forester explain the ETS in a wonderfully succinct way, that um, when carbon foresters are selling their carbon, they're essentially selling their right to land use change. And all these potential options in the future for the carbon price to go down because um, of an expiry of the emissions trading scheme, or we just achieve our targets and we don't need to get more trees planted or keep them where they are. Um, that is an option, but it is very likely that if trees are entered into the emissions trading scheme, there will be an ongoing condition on those trees to be replanted and maintained. And if they aren't replanted or maintained in that area, then uh, the participant would need to pay for the carbon that is lost to the atmosphere when they do die off or to establish forests in other areas in different parts of the country to offset um, the loss of that forest. Well, hopefully um, that answers that question. Uh, so Joyce has asked, any options for trees to be planted on farms that have designated outstanding natural landscapes? So have restrictions on what can be done on the land? Mm. I am unsure. Um, I think currently there are um, different conditions in different regions, depending on um, the characteristics of the land um, as outlined in the district or regional plan. So if it is classified as an outstanding natural landscape, different uh, regional councils and district councils can put conditions about what can happen on that land. 
for example, whether or not you can be establishing trees on that land. And so that's where the relationship between the emissions trading scheme, the overseas investment um, office, and the Resource Management Act kind of come into play. Because um, even though you may be allowed to enter it into the emissions trading scheme, you could be preventing prevented from planting in the first place in your region because of the um, RMA conditions, such as the outstanding natural feature or area. Oh, um, another question here. Any concerns re effects of exotic forests on water flows within catchments? Mm. Yeah, so this is a really interesting one. Um, so there's been a number of studies done over a number of years around what impact um, different kinds of land uses can have on how water is cycling through a landscape system. And one of the indications that we have in New Zealand is that um, there is more water that is utilized by um, trees established in the landscape than is utilized by pasture, for example. So in areas of the country that are really water limited, um, there could be restrictions on the amount of forest that could be planted in those areas because there, there's a concern about the amount of water that would be available uh, to other users, let alone to the ecological well-being of that um, waterway there. Okay, perfect. Um, that looks like, once again, we're up to date of questions and it looks like we've got about four minutes to go, so it might be time to start okay. wrapping up unless there's any more burning questions. Oh, okay. Well, with that in mind, um, thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, please, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, we will be providing um, a farmer submission template uh, via our e-diaries and our website um, to help farmers uh, submit their views on their own. And um, then we'll be writing our own submission on farmers' behalf. Um, as you've already seen, uh, we've sent out a survey. We've gotten some responses so far, but we're really keen to hear from more farmers. Um, so please go ahead and complete the survey or send it on to others who may be interested in completing it. Um, and as we indicated before, we've recorded the session and we'll go ahead and be sending it back to you based on the emails that you've used to register. And we'll also be including in our e-diaries going out tomorrow morning. Right. So with that. Sam, do you have any last words? Oh, no. Um, I think there was a question right at the start is, um, where is Beef and Lamb New Zealand at on this? And, and it's fair to say that we're in the analysis and uh, gathering views uh, stage. So, you know, any comments and views you have, as we said, um, please fill in the survey. And, and Lucy's just put that link uh, for the survey in the chat. Um, but that'll also come out in e-diaries e um, tomorrow. So so for us, uh, we're just really trying to talk to as many farmers um, as we can and, and get those views. And, and as I pointed out at the very start, this is a complex uh, issue and, and there are pros and cons uh, for our farming communities, for our farmers, for our landowners, for our industry with each of these uh, options. So from a Beef and Lamb New Zealand uh, perspective, we're, we're stepping our way uh, through those and and also trying to um, gain a consensus on, on farmer views um, so that we can uh, best uh, represent uh, farmers. But but for us, you know, very much looking at the pros and cons and the, uh, the impacts of the various options, uh, trying to get some uh, expertise around us of, of people that um, understand some more of these market dynamics in terms of the likely um, impacts and using that to, to formulate um, you know our position. Um, the other thing too is if you're writing um, submissions we would love to get a copy of those um, too you know if you're, if you're well organized and you're doing it ahead of time um, that's that's helpful for us just to see what um, your views are, what your experiences are, how it fits for your farm, your local community, et cetera, et cetera. All of that is um, really valuable. So um, listen, thank you to Madeline. Um, I thought you did a great job um, presenting um, tonight, Madeline, and um, having a good understanding of it. Um, but feel free to ask questions because this is a complex uh, area. And um, 
you know, the more you understand, the the better the feedback that you can give as well. So, um, yeah, thank you, Madeline, and um, thank you, everyone, for um, for coming. Great.